Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the last talk of the day in this room. After this, we're going to move to another room for the lightning talks and closing keynote and closing ceremony. I'm going to be opening that room immediately after closing this one at the short break. So if you're giving a lightning talk, please go into that room uh, right after this and upload anything you need to upload, check that you have all the right permissions to talk, um, that kind of stuff. Um, but now I would like to introduce uh, Skal Kienis, who is a data scientist, software developer, electronics enthusiast, a uh, slope lighter pilot, and the founder of a makerspace. And he's going to be talking about slope lighting without going outside and enhancing a um, slope soaring simulator uh, using Python. Uh, take it away, Skalk. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Adriana. Um, yeah, so the title of my talk is Satellite Data and Super Resolution to Enhance a Slope Soaring Simulator. My name is Skalk, so lots of S's in there. Adriana, I had you struggle to pronounce that. It wasn't on purpose. Um, but a lot, lot of S's I thought was appropriate for like a Python uh, conference. Um, yeah, so last year I was looking at uh, PyCon, uh, each competing at the edge of the world, and I was telling you about my hobby, which is slope gliding. And here you can see the glider this is typically what it looks like. Uh, okay, we can build this ourselves, as you can see. And I was telling you about, uh, you know, my transmit and how I enhanced it. Um, and maybe for people that don't quite remember what it's all about, um, you know, slope gliding, you know, we sort of go over weekends or long, specifically long weekends. We'd like to go to the mountains. Uh, and it's an amazing way to commute with, uh, commune with nature. Um, the, the glider kind of flies in, in the air there. Um, so how it works is the, the wind kind of hits the slope and you get the updraft. And you can literally spend hours uh, flying around, uh, beautiful scenery, uh, birds joining you, um, all of that. A short video. I'm going to try to play the video. I'm not sure how well this is going to work, but um, let, let's try uh, just to really give you a sense of uh, yeah, you know what it's all about. So you can see the beautiful sunset there. Um, and you're just flying, like especially late in the afternoon, you, you get these. Uh, amazingly smooth lift and, and you can do this for hours and it's uh, I guess like a form of uh, hypnosis or meditation uh, that you do and uh, this is a reminder of the picture of, of how it works um, uh, and so on. Uh, anyway, um, let me get back to the, the to the talk. I hope you get a sense of, of, of like how much fun it is. So we had this grand idea that on the 12th of April we want to go to the amphitheater. Uh, so the amphitheater is this uh, structure there in uh, the Drakensberg, and um, it's about like when you get to the top, it's 3,000 meters above mean sea level, um, and uh, it's like a 500 meter sheer cliff. So we thought this would be like an amazing. Uh, uh, like a really amazing uh, a place to go and fly. Uh, let me maybe move a bit further away from the from the mic. I don't know if that if that helps. Um, anyway, but uh, you know, obviously, twelfth of April was um, just uh, after lockdown started, and uh, you know, so that plan didn't quite work out. Um, and so, kind of the best next best thing is uh, like I just said. Um, you know, like find something, how can we do slope soaring simulation indoors? Uh, my friend Philip told me about this uh, slope soaring simulator. Uh, he's been using it for years, um, you know, apparently great aerodynamics in it. Um, like, you won't be able to see, you know, all the details here, but um, I, I think just the style of the web page would give you a sense of when this was published last. So this was last updated in 2006. Uh, so the cool thing here is that it was licensed under GPL, um, so you know, completely open source. Uh, you had to go to SourceForge to actually download the, the source code, uh, which you know maybe also tells you something. Um, but either way, um, thought to download it, you had to kind of make it and compile it, and then uh, got it running. Uh, and um, this is a screenshot of, of what that simulator looks like. Um, so you can see there's the little guy, and then the, the glider. Um, kind of rendered. 
and you get this procedurally generated terrain. Uh, so there's like a random code, uh, the random seed for the for the generator you can actually put in. And um, but most of the terrain kind of looks like it. there's some, some water and some trees uh, and so on. Um, but, uh, but Philip was right, the aerodynamics in this thing is amazing. So we spent some hours uh, doing this, but like quickly realized that, you know, something is missing. Um, and one of the elements is, you know, when we go uh, flying these gliders, you know, we often go as a group of friends. Um, and, and so, you know, so the thing would be, okay, you know, why can't we do multiplayer um, gliding? And uh, looking at the documentation, um, yeah, it says multiplayer supported. But like, if you kind of read what it says, it says multiplayer is still very much work in progress. So when this was abandoned, it was you know wasn't quite working, and it actually was only two players. So the way you kind of use it is you you start these instances, you've got the IP addresses in the ports, and you kind of point it to this other. And we were able to do this obviously create some SSH tunnels and, and whatnot, and, and kind of got it going. Um, but we really wanted to, to, you know, obviously get more people involved. Um, and the only way to do that that we could think of is just writing a small Python server. So, okay, we quickly did that. Um, I mean, so the main idea is that each of these instances kind of just sends these update messages of where the glider is now and the other ones receive it. So I found this uh, kind of broadcast server, uh, like simple socket server that uh, it just repeats, you know, whatever the, the first one says, it repeats to the others and, and so on. Um, and, and that kind of worked okay. Um, so the, the messages that it says, it, it actually says within C++, so what it does, it, it kind of just takes the buffer and, and really just writes it into that uh, socket. Um, so like, well, like after a while you're playing, what you found is that these, um, you know, you start getting seg faults. And the reason for that is as people were joining and leaving, you know, the other gliders didn't get that update message. Uh, and um, so we had, you, you kind of had to intercept the, the uh, code a bit. And um, uh, I was using this, um, oh, sorry, I need to switch my uh, deck, just give me a second. Yeah, so, so I had to kind of intercept that uh, code. And I found this amazing library uh, Python called Cstruct. Um, I hadn't uh, before or had any use for it. But basically how it works is you take the structure, uh, so this is a, like a C++ construct, and you put it there as a long string, you know, in the class definition. Uh, and then after that, you can say unpack the buffer and you, you know, kind of uh, access the, the, the different members of it. And, you know, so, so we were quite happy with that. Um, and, and there's a uh, there's a screenshot just proof that, you know, we've got the um, other guys flying with us. And, yeah, so that was lots of fun. Um, so we'll move on. And the other feature that the slash simulator is, apart from the procedurally generated terrain, you can also import, you know, external terrain files. And um, uh, and like the format it, it wanted it is this diesel elevation model. Um, so I've got a couple of slides to explain what the diesel elevation model is and where to get it and, and so on. So, so imagine a diesel elevation model. So this is not it, right? So this is a screenshot from Google Maps. Uh, and this is a, a place in um, uh, that we'd like to go flying. Um, it's close to Newcastle. You probably, probably can't see it on the slide there. Newcastle down there in the end. Uh, Wackerstrom is a tiny little sleepy town just to the right of this picture. And then Fortress, to, you know, like 30 k's further to the right. Uh, those photos in the video that I uh, showed in the beginning was uh, kind of taken not far from here. But either way, so this, so this was the site also not cool. And um, so now imagine you, you kind of look straight down at this um, landscape. And uh, instead of, of just having the color, you know, like the brown and the green and so on, in the image, what you do is you encode the actual elevation above mean sea level, right? Um, and that's exactly what a digital elevation model is. Um, so what this slide just shows is the red bits here is high, and the green bits is low, and the you know, orange bits is sort of in between. And you could, I guess you can kind of see how this would work, you know, you've got the, uh, you know, it, it kind, of, kind, of, kind of translates uh, pretty well. All right, so how do I deal with this in Python? Um, there's actually a number of libraries uh, to deal with it. The one that I found very nice was this thing called Raster.io. Um, you kind of open this diff file, and if you print it, and it prints it as a NumPy array. And like I said, every kind of dot in the image there would be, um, 
the the height about uh, the elevation above uh, mean sea level. Um, it's in 16. Uh, so it's really an image. Apart from the the image data or the elevation data, it also kind of contains the georeference um, data. So what that means is that you know when you uh, plot it, uh, it will actually plot it you know against the GPS coordinates or whatever coordinate system was kind of uh, introduced there. And um, so so it literally knows every dot that you've got there where you know on Earth you know like some reference to the point on Earth um, for that. Um, you, you know, and then you can. Um, then the next question is like, where do we get uh, these these elevation models? Uh, so there's this uh, site called Touch Terrain. It was really made for downloading, you, you know, these structures or mountains. So you can like download a table mountain or sea point or you know, like a piece of the Drakensberg, and you can 3D print it. So that that's the intention of the site. And you can, you know, select this bounding box, uh, you know, on, on the website, and um, you can also specify the file format there as GTIF. So fantastic! So if you select GTIF, then you say download. It will actually download uh, the digital elevation model for you. Um, the other thing is there's this uh, drop down here uh, for for data sources, um, and uh, it says this one, uh, you know, the specific one it's showing here is worldwide. It's good quality. Um, but if you kind of drop down, there's different ones to choose from. Um, so probably three that's worth pointing out. Uh, so there's this USGS uh, National Elevation Dataset. So that's for the United States and Alaska and so on. Um, and uh, so that's at a third arc second. So that translates to roughly you know about 10 meters, like roughly. Okay. Uh, another project that was uh, initiative that runs is SRTM. So you can get this worldwide at 30 meter resolution. Uh, and then there's the other one is the ALOS DSM, um, also global, uh, at 30 meter resolution. Um, mostly because the, um, you know, this website said this is good quality. I was using that, you know, for most of my work. Uh, I can't really comment much more on that. Um, oh, and then the other thing, let me just go back two slides, is that um, if you, if when I look on this web page, there's actually a GitHub repo, so you can go to the GitHub repo and uh, look at what Chris Harding uh, and he, he's collaborated with there, um, and they were using something called Google Earth Engine. That's also something I've never heard before, and um, it's actually quite a convenient uh, tool for getting satellite data, not only digital elevation models but also other satellite data. Um, and the kind of the way to use it is is after you've installed it. You have to do the authentication once, um, and that uh, does this little web sequence where Google, you kind of register on Google that you're using it, and they, I guess they're keeping track about who's using it and you know how much data they're using and so on. You can specify the um, you know the model name, whether it's the that net or the the Alice one. Um, I, I kind of tend to use that one, um, and then um, what you can also specify is the bounding box. So you give it the you know, top left and the top right corners and, and so on. Um, and you can specify the scale. So so let's say you use the one that's 30 meters. Obviously, if you put a scale of 5 meters, uh, what it's going to do is just do some interpolation for you. And you can and that's what this resample parameter is all about. So you want it to do linear or cubic interpolation. And then the final thing here that you specify is the um, CRS. It's like a coordinates reference system. And uh, this special code, yeah, it just means GPS coordinates. Um, yeah, so, so that's quite useful. Um, and then when you download it, um, pull, it pull it into the slope sorting simulator. Uh, and that's also what pop slightly at, at an angle. Um, if, you, if you look at a photo of also what pop, um, yeah, you can kind of see it's, it's the same thing, but not quite, quite all of that convincing. Um, so I thought, well, you know, 30 meter accuracy, you know, probably contributing to my to my woes here. Um, I, I need to do better than that. And um, this is when I was started looking at lidar. So I'll just quickly tell you what lidar is all about. So the way that lidar works is, um, imagine you've got a plane that flies, has got a GPS um, in it. It's got initial navigation, and it's got these lasers, and it shoots the laser beam down, and then it measures the time of flight of the light, so super sensitive instruments. And 
yeah, it, it kind of picks up anything in the way. If there's a tree, it will pick up the tree and, and so on. And um, if, you, if you kind of look at what, it, what the quality of the data is, is, is actually, actually amazing. So these are kind of individual trees that it picks up and you can see, uh, you know, the vegetation and it picks up buildings. Uh, is, is, this is really uh, great quality data. Um, so the question is, okay, fine, wh where do we get this? Um, so the USGS publishes this on the site called entwine.io, um, and each of these uh, colored polygons is a different project. So where they've gone and flown uh, and collected this LIDAR data, and um, uh, the, yeah, so the other point was, um, you know, on this site there's lots and lots of points, I'm not going to even try to pronounce it, 23 gazillion, I guess, uh, points. And, you know, obviously, um, you know, we would want to, we would want to use that. Um, so this kind of uh, introduces the idea, well, we've got this super high uh, resolution data for, you know, everywhere in the world, but, you know, not for, so, oh, sorry, only in the US, but we want to use it in South Africa. So I want to take my amphitheater that I missed out because of lockdown, and I want to kind of upscale that. And, and that was the, when I started looking at, super resolution. So the idea behind super resolution is, you know, you've got a low resolution image, you've got this transformation and you want it to produce a high resolution image. And um, the, the general approach here is to learn, you know, some form of a transform uh, that will take this low resolution data to high resolution. So this is, the, this is these are also digital elevation models. You know, the white here is um, you know, high-lying areas and, and the black is low-lying areas. And you, you, if you kind of look at the highway side, you can imagine this is a little valley with little streams that are coming down, uh, you know, into it. All right. So super resolution, if you start looking around uh, at it, the first thing you'll find is GANs, uh, you know, lots of cool stuff about GANs. Um, if you don't know what GANs are, these are gener generative at the serial networks. And all the cool stuff recently like this, face doesn't exist or this person doesn't exist, that's all done by GANs. And the way it works is instead of doing the translation from image to image, it kind of learns the distribution of, you know, what faces look like and then it can, if you give it random data, it can generate new faces. So, so that's the idea. Uh, or new mountains, you know, in, in my case. Um, and I was super excited, so I thought, let me train again uh, and, uh, you know, I can get some really cool high resolution um, images of slopes. It turns out these things are kind of hard to train, uh, so that that put me off. Uh, but but it is cool. Um, the other approach is supervised, so that's much simpler. So supervised learning uh, simply means that um, you've got examples of low resolution, examples of high resolution. You learn the mapping between the two, uh, and that's it. And they 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 tend to um, you know uh, train. Uh, fairly fast, uh, easy to use, so I thought, well, let, let me go to that. Um, my friend Toby was telling me about this site called uh, Fast.ai, and, and, and this is actually, um, this is actually amazing. Um, so Fast.ai has a number of things. It's a book, you know, about deep learning, uh, machine learning. Um, it's also a, a library that's built on top of PyTorch, so PyTorch is one of the uh, more interest, uh, one of the, the uh, uh, deep learning libraries that, that's used quite often by deep learning researchers. Um, there's also a GitHub repo with lots of um, uh, Jupyter notebooks in it, lots of examples. Um, if you haven't checked it out and you're kind of interested in deep learning, check out fast.ai. I can, I can strongly recommend that. Um, so, like I said, Fast.ai has got a, like a Python uh, library that you install, but it also needs, uh, you know, PyTorch and, you know, Conda is kind of a convenient way to install it. Um, I was looking sp specifically at lesson number seven of the 2019 course. So there's a 2020 course out, which is slightly different structure. It's got some of this content in it, but also new content. And it covers ResNets, UNets, alternative procedural uh, networks. And specifically, most of what I've did, did is just kind of hacking this Lesson 7 Super Res uh, Python notebook. Um, well, all right, so in this notebook, uh, what Jeremy Howard was using is, um, 
uh, something called a UNet, and I've never heard of a UNet before. But like as you can see from the kind of network architecture, it does form this U. It kind of reminds of the autoencoder, so it's, it's got high resolution data, and then you uh, you know crunch it down to lower dimensions, and then you build it up again. Uh, it also has these skip connections just to make it easier to train. And the way that fast AI process is to say, well, actually this contracting path, um, you know, when you down something now, uh, why can't we use like a pre-trained network for that? And they show that you could use a pre-trained uh, ResNet uh, 34, uh, which means, in my mind, means like half of my work is done. You know, the net, half of the network's already trained. I really only need to train this side of the network. Um, and you can plug, plug that in. So like, that's exactly what I did. Um, and this is also from that same Python notebook. You know, he was working on dogs and cats and so on. So low resolution cat, you know, uh, dog in this case, and high resolution dog. And, and then you've got the, this unit that sits in between and just does, does the translation you know, for you. All right, so now I wanted to get some LiDAR data because basically what I want to do is get some uh, you know, high resolution, so LiDAR data, like super high resolution data, and I want to get some low resolution data. And like, I guess you could use either the satellite data, but what I did is I, I kind of downloaded the high resolution data and then just kind of downscaled it. And, and that seemed to work well because they didn't have to match the different coordinate systems and, and all of that. All right, and uh, so PDL, uh, awesome library. Um, it, uh, the way it works, you build up these little pipelines, um, and like, this is a simple version of a pipeline just for, to demonstrate. But you kind of have to give it the bounding boxes. There's a URL. I'll explain now how that URL gets made. Uh, and then the output file name, and you can put various filters and transformations in between. So in this case, it says, you know, remove all of the dots that are classification seven, and classification seven is vegetation. So basically what I'll end up with, hopefully, is just the terrain. Now, LiDAR data you know, can be quite noisy, so you can put other filters in there as well. Um, you know, I played with different pipelines uh, until I was kind of happy, happy with this. And when you execute it, what it would do is it would download the, uh, the, that LiDAR data. Okay, so where do I uh, get the URL? Um, so the USGS actually publishes like that 23 gazillion points all on, on S3. And it's publicly available. Uh, so amazing. And you know that map with those different colored polygons, if you kind of zoom in uh, in the map, uh, you get this project name. And what you do is you take the project name, you kind of stick it into the URL, and it points to this EPT.json file. And that contains the metadata for you know, where the points are uh, and how to read it and so on. But the SpeedL library just knows how to do it. So, so not too much uh, work on my side. And uh, I really then ended up like, writing this big for loop to get as much data as I had time for. Uh, so I ended up collecting like 16,000 tiles uh, from there. So every tile was 128 by 128. So at five meters, it gives us about 0.4 square kilometers. And um, that translates to about 6,000 uh, square kilometers. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, and I guess if I keep running that full loop, I can get like even more. But that, that sounded like a reasonable uh, amount uh, to me at the time. All right, so then I trained my network, um, and I've got some examples or um, some outputs to show you. So, the, and these are obviously very, uh, cherry picked for this very presentation. Uh, some of them are not that great, but these were like, quite impressive. So, um, low resolution, kind of fuzzy, squint your eyes a bit. The high resolution that is, you know, the white is high, the, the black is low, and you've got those rivers. And this is what the neural network was able to reproduce. Um, and this is on the validation set, and others had never seen these mountains before or these valleys before. Uh, similarly, yeah, uh, low resolution input. This was the high resolution from LiDAR, uh, and this is what, what the model predicted it kind of looked like. And I was super impressed by this, um, and I thought, okay, cool. Let me now load it into um, into my slab sorting simulator. Um, oh, sorry, before I did this, this is the amphitheater. Remember, I was telling you about the amphitheater where we wanted to go and fly. Uh, this is kind of the, the plateau at the top. These are little valleys um, and so on. 
and like maybe it doesn't translate so well over the um, you know in the presentation. But when you look at this, this is quite fuzzy, um, and the, the predicted one is to be nice and crisp. Uh, if you kind of uh, you know dive into one of these values, uh, then this is just to give you a sense of what's happening. Um, the left hand side showing the low resolution version of this, um, you know, the kind of bumps, but quite smooth. And then the right hand side is what the, the AI kind of invented. Um, and I was quite happy at this stage to, to now go exploring and, and downloading uh, sites from, from across the world. All right, and now I want to show you just some of the results of this. Uh, but before I get there, um, the one thing I did to, that actually improves this whole thing a lot is just download some ground textures. There's this cool repo, uh, you download it. Uh, what it does, it actually just picks the data there from Bing Maps. You give it the bounding box, and what it will do, it will actually stitch the you know, different tiles together and crop it for you. Uh, so it's so quite amazing. Uh, and you run it, and you get some nice satellite overlays. Um, so that, that's part of the results that I want to show you. Okay, again, this is not the simulator. This is a Google Maps shot. And this is one of those street view things. So if you go onto the top of um, the amphitheater, there's one of those blue dots, and you can drag this little guy there, and this is what it would look like. And you can kind of like, scroll left and right, uh, and so on, uh, get a view. If you can zoom into one particular valley, uh, yeah, again, the shot, and just to then compare uh, what the final results look like in the simulator. So this is the view, same view in the simulator. I'll try to kind of flip backwards and forwards. Hopefully this worked. Uh, I thought, thought, thought this network did a pretty decent job to, to kind of map it uh, uh, and so on. And then the next shot is just um, you, know, you know me flying the simulator now. Yeah, you know, on the from the amphitheater. So my little guy is standing there on the top. You probably can't see it, but on the the right bottom hand side there is the little guy flying. The glider, and I uh, imported some nice clouds to keep uh, to to create some atmosphere. Um, yeah, and I was very happy with this, and then I kind of started exploring the world because now I have a tool that will allow me to download slopes from anywhere in the world and fly those slopes, and um, I'll just give you some some cool results. So this is Yosemite. This is uh, El Capitan Yosemite uh, in the United States. Um, there's that recently there's a video about the guy that climbed this one kilometer structure. So you, there you can see if you kind of look down, uh, one kilometer structure with up ropes. Um, it's quite an amazing video. Go check it out. It's called Free Solo. Um, so I was able to fly from the top there. Lots of updrafts, uh, sometimes a little bit too strong, uh, but pretty cool to fly in. Um, I found this I was, at the time I was reading about um, the Rainbow Mountain in Peru. And this is like a real thing. Like in Peru, is this mountain with these beautiful colors on it. And so I imported that one and I uh, added like this starry night sky because of the, it, like, the whole landscape looks so alien that it's, uh, you know, it, it's just like suited for an alien movie. Um, and um, yeah, so and, and fun to fly there. Uh, some more results. Uh, this is uh, in the Dolomites, uh, some pictures of the Dolomites that, that came out actually pretty well. But what I also wanted to show you, look, look the slope swimming simulator, like apart from just flying from the mountain and viewing the glider, you can also kind of get into the cockpit view. So you, you can kind of like uh, pretend you're not flying. And, and at that stage, I got really obsessed with the idea is let me create a simulator for uh, wingsuit flying. And um, so this is probably one of the, the more famous wingsuit flying uh, videos you'll find online. Uh, the place that a nation sail, and you've got jet callers like, like flying at like, some stage like two meters above the ground, uh, flying like shooting down there. Um, and, I, and I tried to figure out exactly where this was, and I think I kind of got it right if you look where the lake is and that little road. Uh, maybe you can't see it, but that little road is there. So the the, the crack of the grinding, the crack didn't quite translate that well, uh, not quite as, as deep, but. Um, you know, given the data that it was working on, pretty, probably fine. Still lots of fun to fly through and try to dodge the, the edges of that little valley. It actually gets quite a lot steeper as you as you kind of go further along. Um, and the story has a happy ending because um, during the long weekend, uh, me and some friends uh, actually climbed up the chain ladder there at the amphitheater. We got to the top and, uh, you know, we got to fly our gliders there. And, and that was great. And then 
my final thing, I actually just want to show a little video just to um, uh, give you a sense of, of, of you know, of, of what it looks like uh, flying this, you know, flying this uh, simulator. So this is the slope soaring simulator when I started. Uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty nice. It's got clouds and so on. The aerodynamics great. You know, I can fly uh, left and right. Um, and then I'm going to fly into myself. And, the, and this is what the slope soaring simulator looks like now. Uh, nice clouds, uh, amazing scenery, high resolution. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's my talk. I don't know if you've got any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Thanks Scott. Very um, if anyone has any questions, please post them in the group chat and I will read them out. Ah, we have a question from Johan Beers. Where do we get these files uh, for this terrain? Uh, you one that you're asking is, is do you want me to share my files, or are you asking uh, where did I get it? I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Um, I think it's a probably both question. <laughs> okay, okay. So where did I get the terrain? So that was the so, so what I did is I downloaded the diesel elevation model. I ran it through my model, reduced the high resolution. Then I downloaded the um, you know the set uh, the the aerial photography overlay uh, on that. I have published it on S3. Um, happy, happy to share that if, if anybody's interested uh, for for the slab sewing simulator. Um, so there's a, there's a follow up question which I think is um, mostly the same question. So maybe if you can share the link in Discord later, people will know where to get this stuff. Um, and we have. Uh, another question. I've been hunting for some lighter scars of Table Mountain. I know the government commissioned scans, but I'm not sure where to get it. Do you maybe know about Table Mountain scans? That's a question from Dirk. Yeah, Dirk, unfortunately not. Um, the only really readily available stuff I found was the, um, in, the, in the US. There are some photogrammetry, so that's a slightly different technique for getting high resolution. There are some sites and like the open photogrammetry uh, community, but actually very little data that's published there. Cool. Any other questions? Apart from where to get the files, which we will find out imminently in Discord. We have some typing. Um, Johan is asking, anything else you want to do further? Can I help? Yeah, look, I, th I think the, uh, the th thanks, Johan, maybe we should connect and just have a chat. Um, I, I think there's, there's still some couple of things to do. Um, I think now with the, the lockdown being over, you know, obviously the least motivation to work on a, a slab sewing simulator for indoors. Um, but, uh, but, but certainly, yeah, there, there are some, a, a couple of more things yeah, yeah, we can play with. Um, I have a question from Dirk. Are you part of the House for Hack crew that did the FPV from a high altitude balloon? <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, Philip is also on mine. Uh, he was also part of that crew. Uh, that was also an amazing adventure that we did. <laughs> we have some more furious typing. The typing has stopped. Does anyone else have any other questions? You can also uh, chat to Skulk um, on Discord after this. OK, I think that's probably all the questions. Um, wait, wait, wait. Some typing is happening. Last chance. Yes, no. Yes. Oh, uh, yes, that was indeed awesome. OK, so I'm going to close this room in a moment, um, and we're going to move to a new room for the lightning talks and closing keynotes and ceremony. Um, if you are giving a 
lightning talk. I'm going to open that room just after I close this one. Um, so please go inside so that I can um, unlock you and you can make sure that you have all the right permissions. Um, and everyone, I will we will reconvene in the other room at 3.30. Um, so go get tea, snacks, do whatever you need to do. And uh, we'll meet back in the other room at 3.30.